A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, Gird your loins, light your lamps, and be like servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his return. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself. Have the servants recline at table and proceed to wait on them. And should he come at the second or third watch and find them prepared in this way, blessed are those servants. Be assured of this, if the master of the house had known the hour when the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Francis here with you on this 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Again, here, up here in the beautiful uh, High Sierra, here at, at uh, Lake Tahoe. So, hope you're doing well. Hope you're uh, bearing the heat uh, wherever you are. Before I kind of start with my homily uh, that I'm going to probably share uh, the remainder of this video, I, I think I want to try and say something uh, about the tragedies in El Paso and Ohio. Now, <clears throat> I'm not here to advocate uh, for the, the abolition of the Second Amendment, or I'm not here to um, argue in support of the Second Amendment, okay? What I'm trying to share with you is, I think, something we hear in the Gospel today, and it's something that I'm going to also expound upon a little bit later, again, in this video. But I don't know if I have an, a real answer for how to solve the, the gun violence problem in our society. Um, but that being said, let me just share with you something that uh, I gleaned from my upbringing as a, as a young person. And I don't think that young people today are getting this sense. Now, Jesus talks about being prepared. He talks about being vigilant. He talks about being ready in this gospel. In other words, <clears throat> in the midst of, uh, you know, difficulties, he, he's saying that, you know, um, the end of the world will come someday. When This is an allegory, of course, but when he talks about, you know, the master is going to return, he's talking about his inevitable return. And are we going to be ready for that? Are we ready when, when calamity strikes us? <clears throat> are we ready when, you know, we don't, when we get the disquieting news? Um, those are those are things that happen even in our lives, uh, you know, not not so much focused on the second coming, but you know, just when you know life gets difficult, when things turn upside down, things get very difficult really quick. Are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we vigilant? And so, one of the things that I have to say in regards to the the tragedies that seem to happen almost on a weekly basis uh, with the with the with the shootings. I, I think what has happened in our society is that young men and even young women are not taught about uh, gun safety. Okay, uh, let me explain. When I was growing up, we had guns in the house. Um, and there was a sense of, that's not a toy. And I remember my brother and my mom and, you know, my other adult that's in my life, aunts and uncles, you know, we talked an awful lot about guns. Now, we weren't gun fanatics, but we certainly had a healthy respect for the deadly potential that a firearm held. And we were, we were taught how to hold them correctly. Uh, again, that they are not something that you point around like a toy. And you had a, it basically you had a healthy respect that this was deadly. 
this can kill. And you had to treat it with the utmost respect. And the thing was that that was communicated not by a video, not by some, you know, uh, internet uh, YouTube thing, but it was taught to me by my, my parents. Sitting me down, letting me see the gun, letting me even hold the gun, showing me how it worked and made sure that I understood that under no circumstances am I to even touch that, you know, unless they were giving me permission to make go like, like go target shooting or whatever. It, it instilled in me, I, I have to say, a very healthy respect for something that was very deadly. I don't think young people get that anymore. And what's, I think what's really missing isn't so much whether you want to, you know, look at guns as bad or evil. I think it had to do with the fact that your parents, an adult, somebody who was responsible for you was going to instruct you and teach you, you know, a respect for something that was very, very, um, a very powerful, deadly thing. And when they taught you and they, they instilled in you that this is not a toy, this is not something you play with, then there, there, there's part of it, I think, was just that instruction, that, that one-on-one instruction, that, that transmitting of that understanding was so crucial. It made all the difference in the world. Having another person sit you down with this thing that is, yes, potentially dangerous and deadly and, and teaching you the proper respect for that. Uh, I, you know, it's, like, it's sort of like driver's ed. The reason why probably we don't have more kids killed in driver's ed or on the highways, we still do, sadly. Um, but for the most part, why? You had another adult sitting next to you explaining to you what this car is potentially can and will do if you don't either you do it properly and if you do it improperly these are the results okay see there's that one-on-one transmission of understanding and you finally realize oh this isn't a toy i have to be responsible i can kill somebody i can hurt myself i can kill myself because somebody like you know because i had driver's ed I think most young people have a driver's ed, you know, and you would have that training, that coach, and they tell you, you know, this is what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And they give you a proper, healthy respect for something that is potentially uh, very dangerous. And when you have that respect for something that's dangerous, I think it makes all the difference in the world. So that's what I wanted to say about that. I think that we uh, have an opportunity and can we, can, we, can we change it? Maybe over time. But I think families are going to have to come together and instead of blaming other groups of people or you know, pointing the finger of shame and blame and people, which is what we seem to be doing, that's not helping. That's not helping at all. What we really need to do, again, it kind of goes back to the family unit where a dad and a mom can sit children down and explain to them what a gun is, what it's used for, and, have pro- and, and instill in them that understanding and proper respect. That, I think, would go a long ways to kind of quelling some of this. But I think in today's society, we have too many individual loner kids, loner young people, and uh, they get bad ideas. They don't get the proper foundation and formation and understanding when it comes to firearms, and that's where we're at today. Okay, so thank you for let, hearing me out on that one. Um, but today, I wanted to talk about the fact that, um, you know, Jesus talks about us, you know, again, being prepared as we go through maybe difficult times. And there's a, the, the readings today have a beautiful uh, reading from uh, Hebrews about what faith is. Have, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Now, I've noticed that uh, in the recent years that they've kind of changed the wording a bit. I, I don't know exactly what's going on with that because uh, sometimes I, I read these things and I say, wait a minute, that's not exactly the right way it's phrased, but they've kind of maybe 
updated it, but pretty much that's what I've always heard uh, Hebrews, you know, the, the conviction of things not yet seen, let's see, the, the evidence of things not seen and the conviction of things hoped for. Um, and that, those words, those words are very, um, they're very powerful and they're, 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 like a, they're like a life raft to people maybe in the dark waters of, say, calamity or depression. When I'm, I'd just like to compare and contrast that with, you know, some of the phrases and sayings that people in 12-step theology experience, 12-step recovery programs. And maybe you've heard some of these before. Maybe some of you have even clung on to these like I have. But, but sometimes people might kind of, oh, maybe sneer at them and say, oh, those are just old, empty cliches. But I would like to challenge that too. But in 12-step in uh, recovery language, we have certain little stock phrases. Again, you may want to call them cliches. Things like one day at a time. Easy does it. Live and let live. Think, think, think. Um, let's see, this too shall pass. Or one of the ones that was kind of coined in a group that I went to, which is one of the most powerful ones I think I heard. Don't do what's good for you. Don't do what's bad for you. Now, those sayings, as simple as they might sound to some people, uh, I got to tell you that once in a while, when you're going through a difficult time, and there's just so many concerns and ideas and problems and thoughts just, you know, circling around you, sort of like little bugs and gnats that are circling around me right now. Uh, Sometimes one of those little phrases can give you a little pinpoint of light which helps you to focus. This too shall pass. You go, yes, all of this, all these problems that I'm experiencing right now, all this heaviness, all this difficulty, it's for a moment. And some, someday soon, please God, these things will be behind me. There'll be a new chapter in my life. There's a forward movement. I'm moving forward. I'm leaving a lot of this stuff now behind me. And so those little sayings can be like little life rafts or life preservers that somebody throws to you as you're going down maybe for the last time. And you grab onto it and you hold on tight. And you know what? It'll get you through. It'll get you through to tomorrow. And that's the way it is when I hear that Jesus is basically saying, you know, you know, be prepared. Uh, know that, you know, there's, there, the, you know, the time is coming when, uh, you know, the, the Lord is coming back. You know, basically that should be good news to us, you know. You know, in the source, in the midst of tribulation, lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. It's like, okay, you know, it's sort of like, okay, the cavalry will eventually be coming over the, over the, over the, the over the mountains, over the hills. You know, it's it's not the end. It might feel like it. It might seem like it. It might look like it. But if we can just hold on to hope and faith, you know, we can make it to a new day. And, and I really kind of think that that's what uh, our readings are all about today, is finding that little ray of hope in the midst of darkness. You know, sometimes you have to remember that even uh, if you were filled like an, an, an a stadium full of darkness and you lit just one little birthday candle, the darkness can't quench that birthday light. It cannot quench that light. In fact, the darkness begins to recede at the first presence of any light. It can't, it, you know, it's, it's vanquished in many ways. So, um, you know, today, you know, I would encourage you to whatever gives you hope, whatever helps you make it to a new, a new tomorrow, 
a little saying, a little phrase, a little uh, scriptural passage. Uh, maybe it could even be something as simple as, you know, maybe a friend's, um, you know, sayings that sometimes, you know, our, our friends or our, maybe our parents would say things. And you go, well, I remember my mom would say or my dad would say at a time like this. And sometimes you tell people those kinds of things. And I remember one time I said, you know, uh, you might be going through a dark tunnel right now, but, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And this guy said, say that again, say that again. I said, you're going through a hard time right now and it's difficult. No, 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 what you said. And I said, oh, you're going through a dark tunnel, but there is going to be light at the end of that tunnel. And he says, oh, man, did I need to hear that. And again, we kind of think, well, that's pretty simple. <laughs> that, you know, kind of like, well, that's a kind of almost a cliche, a throwaway saying. But he needed to hear that, yes, even though he's going through something dark and hard, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not the train coming either. <laughs> Sometimes somebody likes to throw a little curve into that one. And it's, you know, light at the end of the tunnel and it's the train coming. You know, it's like, it, could, it gets worse. But anyway, I shouldn't have said that. It's probably not the best thing to close my homily with. But, but seriously, um, again, this is what Hebrews is all about. You know, faith is a conviction of things not yet seen, the evidence of things hoped for. You know, we say in the Nicene Creed, every Sunday we believe what we can see and what we do not see, what is seen and unseen. And one, I heard one theologian and philosophers say that we see an awful lot, but for everything that we see, there's even far more things that we don't see that exist. And we would say that that's probably in the realm of God's grace. Hope you got something out of that today. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.